the, about five. Five. It makes almost 30 at the box office, so it was a, a decent-sized hit. Yeah. You know? Um, I think at one point in time, Ethan had said that this film was the only film of theirs that make any kind of a, a significant amount of money. That was before Fargo. I mean... Barry, because Fargo made, like, 60. Well, Fargo also kind of put them back onto the map and was very highly acclaimed. Yeah. But, I mean, everything... Like, Oh Brother Where Art, that was a big hit. Mm -hmm. I know that The Big Lebowski wasn't a hit at the time, but it's gained such a cult following that by now it's got to have made a shit ton of money. Do you know what uh, what the budget for Big Lebowski was? No, I don't. No? I'd be surprised if it was anything over like 12 to 15. Yeah, it wasn't. It can't be that much, but I know that I know that, that was like a movie that, especially working in a movie theater at that time, everyone seemed to hate. All the, you know, especially the older people seem to hate the movie. Really? Yeah. I loved it. You know, Joel and I saw opening night, loved it. But that was a movie that I remember a lot of the people wanting refunds on, you know, saying that they hated it. So I think it was just people didn't get it at the time. And obviously it was not a hit at all, but it's become such a cult movie that I have, I would have a hard time believing if you said that it still hadn't made its money back. Every time I've ever watched it in the theater since, the theater's been pretty full to packed. But I know that those two are hits. Obviously, you No know, Country is, is a massive hit and mm. brings them a lot of acclaim. And I think uh, True Grit is a, is a really big box office hit. That might have been their last like really big box office movie. But uh, even so, like looking back on a lot of their other films, a lot of their films couldn't have cost a ton of money. Mm-hmm. I, I would have a hard time believing that a serious man cost a lot of money to make. No. And even, uh, I would be willing to bet that even stuff like Intolerable Cruel, not Intolerable Cruel, um, Burn After Reading and Hail Caesar, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the people that are in those movies, even though the stack, the cast is stacked. They're pulling in favors. I probably think they're just working on a Coen Brothers movie because they enjoy the experience and they like working with them. I would have a hard time believing that Clooney shows up and saying, hey, I'm only going to do this movie. Pay me 20 million bucks. So he's taking the pay cut to work I, on I think so because he obviously enjoys working with them, has a good working relationship. I think a lot of people, and Hail Caesar especially, is crazy full of, of actors and actresses. I have a hard time believing that any one of those people showed up collecting a huge paycheck they were just doing it to work with the Coen brothers so uh, I, I don't know when exactly he had said that about that Raising Arizona was the only movie up, up until that time that had made a significant amount of money but he's definitely wrong now but yeah like you said Fargo had to have been a, a hit and it also brings him a lot of acclaim and is nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards so that, that could not have been a loser at the box office. It was not. Okay. I just, I, I, when I read that quote, I was like, when was that quote? Because at least Fargo made, made money. You're going to do at least two movies in the next, you know, 13, 15 years past this that are going to be big hits. And that's Fargo and, and O Brother. So here, here we come to how it was received critically. Okay, so first of all, the positive reviews said it was like a deranged fable. Uh, Siskel, we'll give Siskel the shout out because we know Ebert talks shit on it. Siskel says the movie is as good looking as it was funny, gave it thumbs up. Even Pauline Kael, who was notoriously picky at the New Yorker, said the film had, it was no big deal, but it's got rambunctious charm. But then you get to like the negative reviews and it's like, oh, it's all style over substance. Uh, there's laughs, but it doesn't hold together. There's no coherent story. What? And then this guy who writes for the New York Times, Vincent Canby, said, like Blood Simple, Raising Arizona was full of expertise, but had no life of its own. And that the direction is without a, a decisive style, which hard disagree on that. Because with Blood Symbol and with Raising Arizona, they kind of said, this is our style. Mm -hmm. 
So how how they could say that the direction has no decisive style? That's weird. That's insane. And then Roger Ebert. This is the full quote from Ebert, unless you have it. I don't have it. You don't have it. This is the full quote from Ebert. The film stretches out every moment for more than it's worth until even the moments of inspiration feel forced. Which, by the way, the movie's nine, just over 90 minutes. It's like, relax, guy. Since the basic idea of the movie is a good one and there are talented people in the cast, what we have here is a film shot down by its own forced and mannered style. I watched um, the, the video review. <clears throat> And he goes on about how that the way that they talk and the dialect is stupid and they're just trying to be funny, but nobody's actually funny in the movie and just really rips it apart. The dialect is, is very funny, but it's, it's like very yokel. Mm-hmm. He was saying that that takes away from the film and that it's just not funny how it's delivered. It adds character to the movie. Yeah. And it's, it's creating great. it's creating this like heightened world. Yeah, and to get you fleshing out like the Coen brothers, what would become like a, a signature style? Yeah, you know what I mean trademark for them. Yeah, I mean they're even their next movie, they're Miller's Crossing. Like a lot of that dialogue is like pretty stylized, just in a different way. Mm-hmm. I'd have to look up to see what they thought about Miller's Crossing. By the way, I'll give him a shout out. Joel says Miller's Crossing is his favorite Coen brothers movie. Okay. And we we just watched that recently too. He was he was hanging out at the house and we were watching it. I still can't pick. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard with their with their filmography. A lot of strong stuff. But here here we have people that are talking about how good the Coen Brothers is. Um. Uh, Bill Jaribi. I don't know who he, who he wrote for. But he considered Raising Arizona to be the Coen's masterpiece, their funniest movie, and quite possibly their most poignant. I won't disagree with that. I think it's probably probably a better overall comedy mm-hmm. than The Big Lebowski. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going for like just straight madcap comedy, it's obviously going to be Raising Arizona. But The, the Big Lebowski's got kind of that, like, it's a comedic Raymond Chandler story. And it's just... It's comedic because... The characters in that movie are... Too stupid to realize... You know, what's going on. Typical Coen Brothers movie where the characters are a lot dumber than they think they are. Mm-hmm. They always think they're the smartest person in the room and they're probably the dumbest. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what magazine this was. Maybe it's maybe it was in the notes and I just skipped the title because it was too hard to pronounce. A Dutch magazine placed the bank robbery scene second on their top five list of greatest bank robberies in film history behind the iconic bank robbery scene in Heat. Wow, number two. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Holy shit. Simon Pegg says it's like a live action Looney Tunes. Definitely disagree, especially because he's got like the Woody Woodpecker mm-hmm. tattoo, which at the at the end when he's fighting Smalls and he kind of like grabs at the vest, it reveals and you see, yeah. he's got the Woody Woodpecker <laughs> tattoo as well on his chest. Um, Edgar Wright cites it as his favorite movie of all time, and Spike Lee puts it on his essential films list. So it's got some real heavy hitters going to going to bat for it. Mm-hmm. So that that makes me that makes me happy at least. What was Ebert thinking? I don't know. He, I don't know why you would. I know he loves Fargo, or loved Fargo, because I think that was on his best of the '90s decade list. Those, those people love it. I also thought this was really funny. The mayor of Scottsdale, Arizona, proclaimed the film had no redeeming social value, and then it wasn't the image Arizona wanted to project. <laughs> Calm the fuck down, guy. It's a movie. Is he referring to that because most of the characters are kind of rednecky or it's offensive? Or? I guess. I just no redeeming social value, and it's like uh, this isn't the Arizona we want to project. And it's like just relax. It's a film. How many times does L.A. look shitty or New York look shitty? And that's just a handful film. of people, and and it 
it doesn't really ever distinguish, you know, what's real and what's not. You know what I mean? It, in a certain way. So it's like, <laughs> why would you say that about the, something like this? You know what I mean? It's kind of out of pocket. <laughs> just, just relax, guy. Relax. So I think that brings us to the end of my notes. It definitely brings us to the end of this film. Again, hard for me to pick a favorite with the Coen Brothers movie. This is one of my favorites of theirs, at least. Mm-hmm. I just, I love it. I love, I love the dialogue. It's just, it's wacky. It's crazy. I love the, like the over the topness of everything. The Leonard Smalls character is great. How do you feel about? Do you think Raising Arizona is a precursor to uh, somewhat of Wes Anderson's style? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, especially in the beginning when um, at the Arizona residence, it's kind of like that that center frame shot, but mm-hmm. there's a lot of headroom. Yes. And then it's like center frame when the mom is like walking upstairs to mm-hmm. to check. Very much so. Exactly. I was thinking that last night watching. It. I was like, oh, there's. A lot of like kind of Wes Anderson touchstones here, especially in the early going. Awesome! I'm glad I'm not crazy. No, no, <laughs> no that that shot of of uh, Trey Wilson and I don't know the actress's name that plays Mrs. Arizona, but them sitting there like reading the newspaper mm-hmm. and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. Very much has like a Wes Anderson look to it. By the way, I read I read this in the notes. And thought that was interesting, but no, like the movie negates that. It said, because um, and when they're in the, there's that shot of them sitting there in the house and it says, you know, Wednesday, April, April 12th. Mm-hmm. And it says, you know, 8 p.m. Um, I read in the research that people were speculating as to when the movie takes place. Mm-hmm. And they were saying, oh, like it, it because everything kind of looks like 70s. They were saying that it takes place in 1978 because April 12th was a Wednesday in 1978. Mm-hmm. But at the very beginning, when HI is getting his picture taken in the lineup, or you know, in the you know the, the stand-up, the placard that he has clearly says like November 1983. I think November 19, 1983 on it. Okay, so it's early 80s. It's early 80s, and then when they're asking uh, Mr. Arizona about the pajamas, he's like, "They got Yodas and shit on them." Mm-hmm. That's got to be that's got to be post Empire Strikes Back at least. So it's definitely the early '80s. Why someone would claim that it was 1978 when it clearly says November 19th? I believe 19th is the date. November 19, 1983, on the you know like the the placard that he's holding in his mugshot. They didn't study the film enough. Yeah, like <laughs> I picked that out immediately. I think I don't know. The other two years, there was like they said that there was a span of. In the 70s and 80s, there was only three years where April 12th was a Wednesday, and they were kind of speculating as to when that might be. But 78 is definitely wrong, considering some things that are said and, and shown in the film. Just just some dumb trivia that I had come across. Yeah. We're, we're always down for that. <laughs> I think we give this five out of five stolen babies. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I love this film. I'm so glad that, that you were down to do it. Of course, man. Because it is it is pretty madcap. It is pretty pretty crazy. I know that there's a lot of people that are very uh, down on Nicolas Cage. And anyway, this is like, it's so fun. It was so fun to, I watched this like two or three times to get prepared for the show. And it was, it was, it was awesome to see him uh, at so young. Because mm-hmm. you don't, you know, or at least I haven't besides this film ever seen him that that young he's only in a few films before this Mm -hmm. uh birdie i think was before this valley girl is just before this and he's got like you know a blink and you'll miss some cameo in fast times Mm -hmm. he's in rumble fish but not a very big part that's right and that's you know, he, he isn't in a whole lot. This was kind of his more of a breakout movie for him. Like I said, this and Moonstruck are that same are the same year, and then then it kind of puts him over the top. I think it's one of his best performances. Like I said, I'd, I'd put it up there with Bringing Out the Dead and with Adaptation. 
bringing or put it up there with Conair. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding.